In 1998, I was the columnist for the Chicago Tribune, and I had the honor and the privilege of getting to know Michael Jordan and writing about the games through what Phil Jackson was calling the last dance for Jordan's Bulls. I got to see the last dance from the inside out. So with this documentary airing, I thought I would tell you some of my favorite inside Michael Jordan 1998 stories. Number one took place on March 10th that year at the United Center. I went to cover a game between the Bulls and the visiting Miami Heat, who had won nine of 10. They were chasing the Bulls for the top spot in the Eastern Conference. The Heat were known for their physicality. Their motto was brutality without regret. And they had been brutal on the Bulls in their previous meeting in Miami in January, it was 99 to 72 Miami. And I don't know what Vashawn Leonard, the heat guard had said to Michael Jordan that night in Miami, but he either said or did something, or maybe Michael invented it. Because sometimes Michael imagined slights, imagined trash talk that wasn't actually uttered. So that night, in the rematch, at the United Center, I witnessed something I'd never ever seen before and haven't seen since. When the Heat would shoot free throws, you would think Michael Jordan at 6'6 should take a spot along the lane to rebound. Nope. Vashawn Leonard always went back for the Heat to the far free throw line just to stand and be back on defense. Michael would go with Vashawn Leonard every time, stand right next to him, Vashawn was 6'4", and lean down into his ear and just trash talk him through the entire free throw sequence. He did it every time. It was brutality. It was almost unfair. He destroyed poor Vashawn psychologically and then he destroyed him physically. The great Craig Sager later reported that Michael had said something like, and I'm sure this is the cleaned up version, you can't guard me, why are you even trying? That's what he was saying to Vashon. I don't know what it was, but Michael went for 37 points that, that night and it was just destruction. I'd never seen anything like it. It's like he had to take it all out from the 99 to 72 game on poor Vashawn Leonard. And that was my first big taste of Michael Jeffrey Jordan. Story number two took place not too long after. It was April 29th. It was at New Jersey during the playoffs. The Bulls had won the first two games at the United Center. Close games, hard fought games. And that night in Jersey, that arena was on fire because those folks thought that maybe they could muster something up and win a couple of games and force, this was a five game series, maybe force a game five back at the United Center. And during the game, Michael Jordan began to score. That night he went for 38. And nearly every time he made a shot, he ran up court pointing at the coach of the Nets, John Calipari, now the Kentucky coach, was then coaching the Nets that year, pointing at him like, that's for you, that's for you, and that's for you. And I'm thinking, sitting courtside, what are you doing? Was there history between the two? So afterward, and, and it, was, it was a tour de force, he had 16 of 22 shots, just wiped out the poor Nets. I asked Jordan in the locker room, what's going on between you and Calipari? He looked at me and said, nothing. I said, you don't have any personal history? No, I don't even know him. What, why were you pointing at him? I just don't like the way he looks. I don't like the way he struts back and forth in front of their bench. That's it? That was it? Michael Jeffrey Jordan. So let's go to story number three. This one took place on May the 24th. And this was in the Eastern Conference Finals between the Indiana Pacers and the Bulls. 
and it turned out to be all-time great until Jordan took over Game 7 back at the United Center and closed that deal against Reggie Miller and company. But this happened on the off day between games three and four at Indiana. The Bulls had won the first two at home. Indiana had won game three at home and was about to win game four. But this was the off day at Market Square Arena. And the media was allowed in near the end of the Bulls practice session. And I happened to walk in upstairs, sort of on the second deck, because some of the print reporters were allowed in I think first, because we got a glimpse at the very end of the practice of some sort of competition that was going on down on the floor between Jordan and several of the other Bulls and the entire team had gathered to watch the end of it. And I got to see Michael Jordan with a makeshift blindfold on, a small towel that they had wrapped around and tied behind his head, blindfolding him. And he was at the free throw line shooting a left-handed free throw for God knows how many thousands of dollars. And it had come down to this shot, blindfolded, left-handed free throw. And I witnessed swish. And I witnessed four or five bulls who were standing, falling on the floor and rolling around. And I could hear people yelling, he did it again. He did it. He was known to gamble for many thousands of dollars. I don't know how many he won with that shot, but once again, I'm thinking he swished it blindfolded, left-handed, the free throw, Michael Jeffrey Jordan. Whew, which leads me to June 14th. Game six that year, NBA Finals at Utah. And by the way, in game five, I had witnessed something that I rarely saw from Jordan in his entire career. The Bulls had lost to the Utah Jazz, Malone, Stockton and company at the United Center in the previous game, game five. And at the end of that game, Jordan did have a last shot that he missed. It was a tough one. And Brian Russell, who's a tough defender, who knew Jordan and got up into him and was not afraid of him, was all over Michael as he fell away almost at the, the sideline out of bounds and took a, I don't know, nearly a 30-foot three-point shot at the buzzer to win the game. Again, they lost 83-81, low score, defense brutality. But he missed it. And after the game, when I asked him about it, he said, that was cute, cute. I never heard Jordan say cute about anything. It was just cute. I thought, well, it wasn't cute to me. He missed, and I thought maybe he'd bring down the house in the NBA by making that shot. Nope. I guess he was maybe saving something for us in game six at Utah, saving something for the Jazz fans. Because ahead of game six at Utah, I was told that Scottie Pippen, obviously the second best Chicago Bull, had fallen ill. That he was really sick. He was so sick, he was a game time decision, and more so that the Bulls traveling party was worried that Scottie Pippen would try to suck it up and go that night, but then there was a quick turnaround to a game seven at Utah. It was the 2-3-2 format then, so six and seven at Utah. And the Bulls traveling party feared that even if, if Scotty could give you a little bit in game six, he was going to give you nothing in game seven. So it felt like do or die all or nothing in game six. And early on in that game, Scotty Pippen had a wide open dunk and wrenched his back on top of his illness. So Scotty Pippen was hobbled and sick and he managed to tough it out and go 26 minutes in that game. He took seven shots, made four. He had a grand total of eight points. And guess who said, I got this? Yeah, that guy. 23 said, I got this, watch this. Michael Jordan that night scored 45 points in 44 minutes. The rest of the team scored 42. 45 points to 42 points. Scotty contributed next to nothing. And Michael said, I got this. All the way down to the last sequence of the game. 
in which Michael went into the corner and stole the ball from Carl Malone and dribbled the ball up the floor as the clock is ticking down. Brian Russell was in perfect position to stop him. And this is the only piece of sports memorabilia I ever purchased and that I own and that hangs on my wall to this day here in Los Angeles. It's hung on my walls in Chicago, San Francisco and New York and now in Los Angeles. I savor it every time I walk by it. It's a picture from the far baseline of Michael Jordan having just slightly pushed off on Brian Russell, different era, different hand checking, different kind of physicality. It was okay then, little, little push off, subtle but effective to gain a little bit of space to go straight up from, I don't know, maybe 18 feet, three or so beyond the free throw line. And my picture is from the far baseline of Michael holding the pose. And you can see the looks on the faces of all the jazz fans in the far baseline, the horrified looks of, because the ball is going through the net in my still photo and they know he did it to them again. He held the pose on his final shot with the Chicago Bulls and he had done it to them again. And here's my favorite part of the photo. Scotty Pippen you can see in the frame over on the right side on the wing standing at the three point line like this. I'm open, I'm open. Michael didn't even give him a glance. Scotty had taken no threes in the game and Scotty Pippen was not going to take the final shot at Utah. Really the final shot of the prime of Michael Jordan's career, his Bulls run, his six championships with six MVPs that finalized with that shot that night and that picture. No, Scotty, sorry. You're still Tonto to the Lone Ranger. And the Lone Ranger said, I got this. And he swished it, game over, Michael Jeffrey Jordan. So then a couple of weeks passed and Michael was scheduled to play in a pro-am golf tournament in Chicago. And I still couldn't get it through my mind. He's pledged allegiance for life to Phil Jackson. And just so you know, Phil Jackson and Jerry Krause, the GM, had fallen completely apart. I also got to know Jerry Krause that year along with Phil. Jerry Krause was a chubby little guy with an ego even bigger than Jordan's. Jerry Krause had started after playing a little bit of high school baseball as a catcher, I believe, he didn't come across as real athletic to me at about five feet, four inches tall. He'd started out as a scout for the White Sox, owned by Jerry Reinsdorf, who also owned the Chicago Bulls. And Jerry Reinsdorf had taken a liking to little Jerry Krause because they were sort of birds of a feather, partners in quote unquote crime, if you will. And Jerry Reinsdorf needed a bad cop to general manage his Bulls. He needed somebody who would do his bidding, but who would ride herd on those Chicago Bulls. And it was Jerry Krause. Jerry Krause did not draft Michael Jordan. He came a year after Jordan was drafted by Rod Thorne. And Jerry was hard to handle, hard to get along with. And I did not get along with him. I clashed constantly with him to the point that it, after one playoff game at Charlotte, I saw him as I was coming out of the, the public restroom there in the arena, ran into him and he was furious over something I'd written about him, which was just the God's truth. And he said, how can you do this to my family? And my response was, how can you do this to your family here with the Bulls? You're going to break this team up because you don't like Phil Jackson? Phil Jackson despised Jerry because he had no respect for Jerry Krause. And at every opportunity in front of other staffers, he would humiliate him by ridiculing him because the truth was he deserved to be ridiculed. And because of that, he had dug in before the year and made it clear to Phil, I don't care if you go 82-0, and 0, 
you're not going to coach after this year with this team. And he had made it clear that he had fallen head over heels in love with Tim Floyd, the coach at Iowa State. Tim was a fine college basketball coach, but the prospect of Tim Floyd replacing Phil Jackson and Michael Jordan with the Bulls was mind blowing to me. And I still couldn't get it through my head that Michael would actually follow through with his vow that if you fire Phil, I'm gone. But Michael, stubborn to a fault, proud to a fault, but fiercely proud, said, no, I'm out. Phil's out, I'm out. It got so bad that Jerry Krause in a wedding uh, that he threw for his daughter the summer before 1998, invited Tim Floyd to the wedding and didn't even invite Phil Jackson. That's how far they'd fallen out. So last shot, hold the pose, game over. Phil's gone. Michael, I'm gone. Big announcement, media conference, the United Center, I'm gone. So here we are a couple of weeks later and I went out to make sure at this Pro-Am golf tournament that Michael was going to stick by his guns on this and that there's no way he was coming back for the Bulls or anybody else. So he saw me after a while, I don't know, it was on the 14th or 15th hole, and he waved me inside the ropes so I could walk with him. Maybe the 15th hole. It's a par five, long golf hole. And Michael, unfortunately, had sent his tee shot into a fairway bunker. And he asked his caddy for his three wood. Well, if you know golf, three wood, out of the sand, not an easy golf shot on a par five. And I said to Michael, that's tough. And he turned to me and said, I'm just going to imagine the golf ball is Jerry Krause's face. Jerry Krause's face. That's how much Michael Jordan had come to hate this little man who held the fate of the dynastic bulls in his little hands. And he crushed that three wood almost made it in two to the green. It fell just maybe five yards short. We had an easy chip up for his birdie. And that's when it hit me. He is really gone. Michael Jeffrey Jordan is really gone. So I didn't see Michael for a while. Nearly a year passed. Now we're going all the way into the following basketball, the two basketball seasons. And this story involves one of Jerry Krause's next draft picks, his actual bottom of the first round pick in 99, kid named Corey Benjamin from Oregon State, the next Michael Jordan at six feet, six inches tall. Krause loved him. And Corey loved himself so much that he made the mistake on draft night of saying publicly, I'm sorry Mike retired because I was looking forward to taking him, as in beating him one-on-one. -on -one. Kid, no. So Michael remembered, Michael waited a while. Now it's Tim Floyd's second go-round with the Bulls. They're horrible. They've got Ron Artest and they got Elton Brand. They still had Kukoc, but they were horrible. And one day in November, early in the year, at the end of practice, guess who walks in the door unannounced? Yeah, 23 walked in in his sweat clothes. And he didn't know Tim Floyd, but Tim was in awe of him. I knew Tim very well. And he asked Tim very respectfully, coach, would you mind if, if I played him one-on-one -on -one? and pointed to Corey Benjamin, poor Corey Benjamin. And Tim said, Sure, if he's game, sure. And what was Corey Benjamin going to say? No. So Jordan took off his top, but he kept his bottoms on, his sweatpants on. Let's go. And Michael Jordan destroyed poor Corey Benjamin. He just scored and scored and scored on him in, in every way, shape, and form imaginable. I got to see that killer will on display one last great time against poor Corey Benjamin.
He stole the ball from him. He intimidated him with his defense. And by the way, those Bulls teams, greatest defensive teams I've ever seen. Michael Jordan made first team all defense his final year in 98 while winning the scoring title. And poor Corey Benjamin was so psychologically shot by what Jordan did to him that Corey Benjamin never amounted to anything. He hung on for about three years with the Bulls, then he bounced around the league a little bit, then he bounced around overseas a little bit, and he was out of sight, out of mind. And Jordan came over and told us in the media afterward that was a lesson. It wasn't just a lesson for Corey Benjamin, it was a lesson for Jerry Krause. You took that guy and you thought he could replace me? Well, I just did that to him. I'm, I'm getting goosebumps just telling you the story. Thank you for watching. Thank you for sharing this with me. And Michael, Thank you for the memories in 1998. watching you can subscribe here to get the latest from the show and be sure to check out more of the best clips from undisputed or go watch a few other segments from our other shows on fs1